All right, welcome back to the next lecture. Let's dive in with a matching exercise. Go ahead and hit that pause button. Try and figure this one out and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. All right, so here are the correct answers. I'm gonna to jump to the next picture, next slide, and just uh, talk a little bit about these layers. So if we look at the function of the different epithelial cell junctions, this picture is basically similar to the one that you're gonna find in your books. Um, I figured it would be easier to discuss this having this visual. So let's take a look at the junctions and what function each enables between the cells. So first, starting from the top, we have, of course, the tight junctions. These are also known as the zona or zonula occludens, this is going to prevent cellular movement of solutes, and it's composed of clodins and occludins. The adherens junction, which is also known as the zonula adherens, is going to connect the actin cytoskeletons of adjacent cells with cadherins, which are calcium-dependent adhesion proteins. Now, the desmosomes, also known as macula adherens, provide structural support through intermediate filament interactions. Now, this is an important structure because if we have an autoantibody to desmoglein 1 and or 3, it can lead to pemphigus vulgaris. That is a chronic skin blistering condition. Then we have the gap junctions, which have connexons. These are channel proteins, and this allows for chemical and electrical, communi electrical communication between those cells. Now, hemidesmosomes are needed to connect keratin found in the basal cells to that underlying basement membrane. The final structure here we have are the integrins which are membrane proteins that help to maintain the integrity of the basal lateral membrane by binding to laminin, collagen, and fibronectin, all of which are found in that basement membrane. All right, let's move on to the next question. We've got a big matching question here. This is testing your ability to recognize different skin lesions. So take your time, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got everything right. All right, so here are the correct options. I know that might be a little tricky to see, so hit that pause button, try and figure out if you've got everything correct, and then we'll move on. So this is all really straightforward definition kind of stuff, so I wouldn't expect you to get a question that simply asks you to define something, but definitely expect to see these definitions throughout the entire exam, all right? So if you don't know what they're trying to tell you by saying macule, patch, papule, plaque, then you're not going to be able to recognize what disorder or symptom or, or syndrome they're trying to point you down the road of. So with that said, let's quickly go over the main dermatologic terminology that you need to know to make sure that on exam day, this stuff doesn't throw you for a loop. So first we have the macule. Macules are flat lesions with well-circumscribed changes in skin color. And the lesion is going to be less than one centimeter. Think of a freckle uh, anytime you hear the term macule. Now, Next, we have a patch. A patch is just a macule that's over one centimeter in size. Think of a birthmark when you hear the term patch. A papule is a solid lesion that's less than one centimeter, but it's elevated. What's a classic example of a, of a papule? Think of the mole, the common mole. Next up is a plaque. A plaque is a papule that's over a centimeter. Now, if you think about the plaque seen in psoriasis, that's gonna help you get a clear picture in your head of what a plaque is. A vesicle and bulla are the same thing essentially, which are fluid-filled blisters or fluid-containing blisters, except the vesicle is less than one centimeter, the bulla is greater than one centimeter. Then we have a pustule. Now, as you might have guessed, this is a vesicle that contains pus. Any pus-containing lesion can be a pustule. A wheel is a smooth plaque or papule. Think about an allergic reaction uh, that can cause hives. See those red marks all over someone's arms and body? Those hives are wheels. Now, a a scale is like a flaky lesion. So think of a, like a, a lizard or a snake. They're scaly, right? They're, they're also flaky looking. Um, think of eczema or psoriasis and the flaking off of that stratum corneum. That is demonstrative or, or, or a visual you can use to recognize a scale, flaky lesion. And finally, under our umbrella of macroscopic terms, we've got the term crust. Crust is simply dry exudate. You see this in something like impetigo. Okay, let's move on. Those are some basics. Let's move on to the next 
matching exercise. Now let's take a look at some of the microscopic terms that you should know. All right, so hit that pause button, try and figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you've got everything correct. How did you do? Hopefully you did well. Otherwise, you can pause if you need to fix anything or double check your work. But let's take a look at our microscopic terms, starting with hyperkeratosis. What is hyperkeratosis? This is something that occurs when we've got increased thickness of the stratum corneum. Think about psoriasis. So the way that they're going to ask you these questions is they're going to demonstrate, they're going to explain probably the gross finding, and then they're going to say this is what we saw when we looked at it microscopically. So if you know what both terms are, macroscopic and microscopic, super easy to tie them together, okay? Um, parakeratosis is characterized by retention of nuclei in the stratum corneum. You can also recognize this in psoriasis or actinic keratosis. Hypergranulosis is characterized by increased thickness of the stratum granulosum. An example of this would be something like lichen planus. Spongiosis is when there's an epidermal accumulation of edematous fluid in the inter, not intra, inter, cellular spaces. Think eczematous dermatitis in this condition with this description. Acanthalysis is a term that describes separation of the epidermal cells. Think pemphigus vulgaris when you hear acanthalysis. Our final term here is acanthosis, which is epidermal hyperplasia. Think of things like psoriasis or acanthosis nigricans when you hear the term acanthosis, okay? Make sure you know that micro and macroscopic definitions, they will help you solve a lot of problems on exam day. All right, let's move on to our next question. We got a multiple choice question. Hit that pause button and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. The correct answer here is C, melasma. Okay, well, let's take a look at three commonly tested pigmented skin disorders, such as albinism, melasma, and vitiligo. We'll also touch on a few other conditions listed here as distractors, which are seborrheic uh, dermatitis, melanocytic nevus, and pseudofolliculitis barbae. So first up, what is albinism? It's not on here, but we need to talk about this as it is one of the pigmented skin disorders. Albinism is a genetic disorder. It's an inherited autosomal dominant, recessive, X-linked, what is it? It's an autosomal recessive inherited disorder, which remember, this means someone affected had parents who were carriers, most likely if they didn't have the disease. If one of them did, it meant they were homozygous recessive. But typically, skip generations will show us that the two parents had a child affected. That means the parents were both carriers who didn't have the, uh, they had the genotype, but not the phenotype. So they were heterozygotes. They had a one in four chance, the child, of inheriting two recessive alleles and becoming homozygous recessive. Make sure you remember that information. Now, the gene affected in cases of oculocutaneous albinism is going to be the OCA genes. Now, people who inherit this condition end up with a decrease in melanin production as a result of a decreased tyrosinase activity or a defect in tyrosine transport. Remember, this patient has a much higher risk of what type of cancer? Skin cancer. That's because they lack pigment. This means we have to take aggressive measures to protect them from the sun. <clears throat> Next up is melasma. This is a type of acquired hyperpigmentation that's most likely going to happen as a result of two things, pregnancy and what's the other? OCP use. Third is vitiligo here, and this is characterized by those irregular patches where there's a complete lack of pigmentation. Now the problem here is the destruction of melanocytes in those affected areas. Now this is most obvious in someone with darker skin because the areas lacking melanin become much more pronounced. So typically you'd see an African-American person or someone who uh, is perhaps European with darker skin and those white patches makes it a lot easier to see. Someone who has very light skin, it's gonna be really, really hard to see that. You might not even notice at all, okay? So keep that in mind. Now, before we explore some of the other commonly tested dermatologic conditions, as I said, let's look at seborrheic dermatitis, melanocytic nevus, and pseudofolliculitis barbae. So first, what is seborrheic dermatitis? Well, this condition is characterized by the presence of erythematous, well-demarcated plaques with greasy yellowish scales, and you'll find them whenever there's an abundance of sebaceous glands. So think of places like the scalp and the face. Interestingly, this is associated with Parkinson's disease. 
Now this can be managed with things like topical antifungals as well as corticosteroids. The next condition, a melanocytic nevus, is nothing more than the common mole. And while it's typically benign, melanoma can arise if the lesion becomes atypical. That's why it's always important to recognize moles on your body. You know, if something looks a little off, keep an eye on it. Take pictures regularly so that if you go to the dermatologist, you can show them this, these, these pictures. It's very important. Um, and then we have pseudofolliculitis barbae. This is a condition known to happen from shaving. The layman term would be razor bumps. I had a couple the other day just from shaving. They go away typically in a day or so. I remember, this is an inflammatory skin disorder, and the lesions that develop are firm. They're hyperpigmented, papules and pustules, um, and they are both painful and itchy. Um, you know, from my experience, they get really red, swollen, and they're more itchy than they are painful. Um, sometimes, it doesn't always happen though. Sometimes I'll be scratching my neck a lot. Sometimes it doesn't happen at all. Um, but yeah, that's going to be happen. That's going to happen from um, irritation caused by shaving. All right. Uh, I don't know if that was too much information, but I figure I'd share uh, whatever I could with you guys. All right. Let's move on. Let's do another matching exercise to test our ability to match common skin, uh, common skin disorders with their associated findings. So go ahead, hit that pause button, and then come on back when you think you've got the right answer. All right, here is the correct answers. If you need to double check this, go ahead and hit that pause button. Otherwise, let's take a look at some of the common skin disorders that we need to recognize on the exam. Now, keep in mind, we've touched on a couple of these uh, on previous slides, so I'm not just gonna repeat the same things over and over, but I wanted to test your ability to recognize. Now, first up, we've got acne. Acne can occur for a variety of different reasons, and this is the result of colonization of the pilosebaceous unit with cutie bacterium acnes. Which forms, uh, which forms comedomes, as well as inflammation that can cause the formation of things like papules, pustules, nodules, and cysts. Now, we will see an increase in sebum production, as well as abnormal keratinocyte desquamation in this condition. So that's a histological finding I want you to keep in mind. Next up, atopic dermatitis. This is typically just known as eczema. Now, eczema is a specific type of hypersensitivity reaction. Do you know what type? Is it type 1, type 2, type 3? What is it? Eczema is a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, and it's characterized by pruritic eruptions, so itchy breakouts. Now, this condition is also associated with other atopic diseases, like allergic rhinitis and asthma. Now, a couple interesting facts that I want you to keep in mind about eczema is that you'll see an increase in serum IgE, and there is a mutation of the filigrin gene, and that predisposes someone to this condition. So watch for this effect in the face during infancy and the anticubital fossa in both children and in adults. Next up is allergic contact dermatitis. This is also a hypersensitivity reaction. You should know which type. Tell me. One, two, it's type four hypersensitivity reaction. This occurs secondary to an allergen exposure. Commonly, you'll see this in response to things like exposure to nickel, copper, other metals, poison ivy, things like that. Okay, next up is psoriasis. Now we touched on this a bit earlier when we mentioned it as part of the psoriatic arthritis condition. In psoriasis, what happens is we get skin lesions without the arthritic condition. Now some of the characteristics of this condition include the presence of those silver scaly-like plaques that commonly present themselves on the knees and the elbows. Now in psoriasis, you'll see an increase in the stratum spinosum and a decrease in the stratum granulosum as well as the commonly tested auspit sign. This refers to the presence of pinpoint bleeding spots where the dermal papillae are exposed when scales get scraped off. Now don't forget to watch for pitting of the nails as well as arthritis, which that can change the diagnosis from simple psoriasis to of course, psoriatic arthritis, okay? Next up we have rosacea. Rosacea is an inflammatory facial skin disorder that's characterized by the formation of erythematous papules and pustules. Now this can be different from acne in that there are no comedomes in this condition. So that's really important to keep in mind because they can look similar. Now this is often also associated with flushing of the face and that happens in response to some external stimulus, oftentimes alcohol. So watch for someone who drank alcohol, develop flushing of the face, think rosacea, okay? Now we have two more conditions to discuss here. The first is Veruca. Now these are simply warts that are caused by non-cancerous HPV strains. 
Okay, hopefully you know which strains of HPV are cancerous versus non. We talked about that a little bit earlier, so I'm gonna see uh, if you know that, so flirt it out, hopefully you know. Uh, remember, these are tan colored, these are soft, and they're also described as being cauliflower-like. Microscopically, you're gonna see epidermal hyperplasia, hyperkeratosis, as well as coilocytosis. Now, the last thing I wanna to touch on here is urticaria. Urticaria is just hives. This leads to the formation of those itchy wheels that develop as a result of mast cell degranulation. Now, superficial dermal edema, as well as lymphatic channel dilation are characteristic findings of urticaria. All right, let's move on to our next question. We've got another matching exercise. This will be the last one for the lecture, and then we will end. So go ahead, hit that pause button, try and figure this one out. Then come on back when you think you've got the right answers. All right, here are your correct answers. If you need to pause and, and correct anything or just double check, please feel free to do so. Otherwise, let's start with the vascular tumors of the skin, starting with the angiosarcoma. Now this, the angiosarcoma is relatively rare and it's usually seen in the head, the neck, and or the breast areas. Now, watch for an older person who presents with a lesion on sun-exposed areas of the face. A couple things I want you to keep on the lookout for with this lesion is A, a history of radiation therapy, and B, a history of someone who has chronic post-mastectomy lymphedema. Now there's a specific type of aggressive angiosarcoma associated with exposure to arsenic and vinyl chloride. Do you know which organ this is found in? If you said the liver, excellent job. And what I'm referring to here is the hepatic angiosarcoma. So please make sure you remember this important exposure link. Next up, we've got bacillary angiomatosis. This is found in AIDS patients and it typically presents as a papule in the capillaries of the skin. Now this is a benign lesion and it's caused by infection with two specific types of Bartonella. Do you know which those are? If you said Bartonella hensile, you've got one. What's the other one? The other one is Bartonella quintana. If you got them both, excellent job. Now remember that Bartonella is a gram-negative bacteria and it's acquired oftentimes from scratching of a cat. So the cat, cat scratch disease, cat scratch fever. Um, one final important detail that you need to keep in mind is that this lesion is oftentimes mistaken for what? Especially in an AIDS patient. Kaposi sarcoma. Okay, they're both associated with AIDS, but Kaposi is rarely mistaken for Bartonella. So Bartonella is often um, mistaken for Kaposi, but Kaposi is very rarely mistaken for the other one. So a little confusing, but just one is mistaken for the other, but not the other way around. Now, what is the Kaposi sarcoma? It is an endothelial malignancy and it affects the skin, the GI tract, the mouth, as well as the respiratory tract. Now remember, I said this multiple times already, but it's so important that I need to keep saying it. This is associated with AIDS. It's also associated with organ transplant patients and a specific type of person, <clears throat> which is a male who is also of European descent. Now, aside from HIV, do you remember which virus Kaposi sarcoma is associated with? That's an easy one the HHV8 virus, okay? Another differentiator between this and bacillary angiomatosis is that in this condition, which I'm talking about, Kaposi, you'll see lymphocytic infiltration. In bacillary angiomatosis, you'll see neutrophilic infiltration, okay? So lymphocytic in Kaposi, neutrophilic in bacillary angiomatosis, all right? A couple more here. Let's talk cherry hemangiomas. These are lesions that you'll typically see in middle-aged adults. And while it doesn't regress, this is benign. Now, as someone ages, there's typically an increased frequency of this lesion. The glomus tumor is next. Now, the glomus tumor is a little reddish blue tumor found under the fingernails. It's a benign lesion, but it is also painful. Now, this tumor comes from modified smooth muscle cells of the glomus body. Now, just an interesting side note, I remember on my step two CK exam, I had a question about this. This was a long time ago, and I had not, I had glossed over derm studying for my step two CK and I got this wrong. And so this glomus tumor will forever haunt me because it's so easy to remember. It's just a tumor under the fingernails. What causes it? It's benign, but it's painful. I still think about it to, the, to this day. Don't make the same stupid mistakes that I made, okay? Glomus tumor under the fingernails. Next up, we have pyogenic granuloma. This is a capillary hemangioma and this is known to ulcerate and bleed. And this is associated with both trauma and pregnancy. 
The last one we have here is the strawberry hemangioma. This is a benign capillary hemangioma. We see this in infancy. Now, typically, this shows up within the first few weeks of life and grows rapidly. Then, out of nowhere, it spontaneously regresses. Typically, we see this between five and eight years of age. All right, that is it for this lecture. I will see you guys on the next one.